Okay, it's going to give me a little meeting invite. <clears throat> Invite so a speaker. There we go. Fabuloso. Yeah. <clears throat> right. We okay. Let me just check that everything is on. We're live and kicking fan. Fantastic recording, recording live. It's like this sort of, I feel like I'm in front of the sort of Apollo capsule with all these kind of mission control <clears throat> vibes. Feels like yeah. it. Yeah. It we, feels we, like it. Well, you don't, you don't have to manage anything. I'm the one who does all the hard work, John. No, I've got to wait in anticipation for the invites and <laughs> press buttons. And exactly. Hope the technology holds. How are you? <clears throat> uh, yeah, we were just talking about that. Uh, yeah, getting there. Glad it's the end of the year. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been quite a year, hasn't it? It has. Mm. My God, it has. Yeah. Um, mm. A lot of new things, a lot of good things bubbling away, but uh, I can't help but feel like it's difficult to shake this feeling of a lot of hard work that's happened. And so pretty pooped, pretty tired, right. as I'm sure you are too. Honest. The The world keeps you honest, Alex. <laughs> well yeah exactly mm. so welcome if you're joining us on linkedin if you're joining us on humble mind um every tuesday at this time john cherry and i get together to talk about all things uh to do with customer behaviors and trends innovation all with the future in mind and uh, that's exactly what he does for a living he does the future he is a futurist a strategist by trade <clears throat> and uh yeah always a fun and super interesting conversation. Uh, and uh, so for today, we've got a couple things that seem to have captured your attention over the last little while, John, and just going straight into um, <clears throat> the first one here, I'm just going to post a link for um, those of us following on LinkedIn, to look at what's going on in the world of the simplest brands. Uh, and it's really interesting to see which which has topped the list, which <clears throat> um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll uh, say which one has after i've given you a chance just to give us some background on why the story caught your attention and uh, what we can what we can choose to notice about it right so there's a branding agency uh what is their name siegel and gale interesting name for a branding agency they produce a report every single year i think this is now the 10th year that they're producing this report and what they do is that they rank the top 10 simplest brands globally and then in different regions mm. um, and what they're really trying to do is they they're trying to find brands that are very transparent and very apparent as to what it is that this brand sells for who how do you sort of engage with the brand uh, how do they package the value all of that kind of stuff they they then rank brands uh, based on on certain metrics um yeah and and they've done this every single year as i said for about uh, for about a decade um and i think you saw the the number one global brand which is uh, a, a german supermarket group lidl is that how you pronounce it lidl, lidl yes i go lidl. there almost twice like lidl. at least twice a week yeah lidl right yeah, they're amazing so so lidl is uh, is the leader um, and I think the reason is, and they kind of like give you a, an idea in, in the description, that Lidl are, are one of those brands that are always looking at ways of innovating their offering to kind of make it just more accessible to a wider audience. So they package veggies and, and fruits specifically for children. They're very transparent about um, their prices and they, they don't make the stores overly complicated. Um, and even when I looked at their catalogs and their brochures, they try and keep it as simple and uncluttered as possible. So, you know, with all of these things, uh, it's it's always good to ask yourself, so what? Like, what, is, what does this mean for, for marketers or brand managers? Um, is there really a demand from customers for simplicity? Mm. And I suppose my argument to that would be absolutely, because... Every week, I suppose, we sit here and we say, wow, Alex, the world is so complex. You know, it is such a chaotic place. It feels like everything is happening all at once. Um, and that's not necessarily a good thing. And what you really don't want is that you don't want businesses that you do business with 
to to add to that burden. You know, you kind of want to go to a supermarket and they must make things easy for you. So the user experience has to be, yes, pleasurable, but it also needs to be uncomplicated. Um, you know, I always can't stand the idea when there's multiple T's and C's and I have to jump through this hoop and pull this lever and then maybe I'll get something. And there's supermarket groups in this country who have loyalty programs, which are so confusing. Uh, you can spend an awful lot of amount of money with them. And then what you get back as a reward is like, you know, less so, than half a cent. So, so <laughs> it's, yeah, it, I, I suppose that's what the, that's what the need is. It, it seems to be more of a, a want and more of a need for that kind of simplicity. Absolutely. And I suppose another word for the simplicity could be similar to what we talked about last week with Amazon, which is this this kind of, you know, undying devotion to being customer centric and always putting the customer at the heart of what you're doing. So perhaps there's there's a similarity or a big overlap, at least with simplicity and customer centricity. But are there examples of or maybe things that we've maybe seen before? or in your experience where if you don't keep things simple or if you're complicated <clears throat> like that it, it, it's 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 going down the wrong path like what are the hallmarks of being simple as a brand mm. uh yeah it's such a good question because it's uh yeah there, there's simplicity of perception so as a customer that that's ultimately what you want to achieve is you want to you want to feel like the offering is very very easy to understand and very easy to to sign on um, and a great example of that i suppose would be google um, now if if you use google as a developer i think maybe if you're looking at google analytics that's probably the most complex thing i've ever seen right um, it's it's very difficult to actually understand what's going on there but if you are a general user of the google homepage. They've made it pretty seamless. Um, it's a very easy service to use. So you don't even have to pay for it uh, intrinsically. Mm. Uh, um, but yeah, that's that's a great example of, of someone that gets it right. Companies that get it wrong, well, I don't know what banks are like in your country, but banks here are pretty bad. Um, and I think the, the, the problem that banks have is that their operating models are incredibly complex because they're built on top of older operating models. Mm. So most banks sit on legacy IT systems that are so lumpy, they actually can't do anything about it. So there's no ways that they can actually migrate those things. Mm. So they're just managing the mess, really. Um, and I think what happens as a customer is that you experience that mess, maybe not directly, but you just get a sense that there's a mess behind the scenes. Mm. Um, and yeah, we can point to many businesses where that is the case. Um, and often you'll notice it because companies will start to cut costs and where they cut costs is in customer service. Uh, so yes. when you call a call center and now all of a sudden it's being automated, uh, whereas, you know, a couple of months ago, you used to be able to actually talk to somebody. Um, I had an experience this week where my internet went down and I'm with a service provider that I'm kind of forced to use because of where I live. Um, but yeah, the, the actual data coming into, into my office had, uh, stopped working and to try and get somebody to help me because nowadays that I'm at a call center, I have to WhatsApp them and just for them to reply to the WhatsApp took two hours. And then they had to then go to another service provider that actually manages the line and then, you know, indicate that there was a problem with the line yeah. and they had to sort it out. So all in all, I was down for about four hours. Now, four hours during the workday for someone that works from home, that's at least two meetings. Um, that's a lot of uh, cloud access that, <laughs> that I missed. Yep. Um, it's half a day. Yeah. Right. So it just shows you that that is now a complex system. So, you know, they didn't really think about that, that experience, which should, should be seamless. So, yeah, I, I don't think, you know, in the hierarchy of what businesses focus on, Many of them focus on cost reduction. So can we optimize the, the operational value chain so that we can mm. maximize our profit? They don't necessarily think about, oh, can we make this brand super simple so that it's easy for somebody to understand. And once they become a customer, it's very easy for them to continue to be a customer. Um, yes. That's not the, you know, the point of view from which they operate. It's, it's, 
it's so true. And once again, like we always do every Tuesday, we always come back to kind of these home truths, right? About customer, you know, doing right by customers is often, you know, doing quite simple things really well, you know? And so um, something like, well, you've actually got them on your article, you know, how to be simple, how to get those things right. It's about being transparent. It's about putting the customer first in terms of the decisions they make, the education they need behind what they buy, the brands they choose, what kind of purchasing decisions, uh, investing in being able to support them when they need support. So being able to have 24 seven, you know, chat support or whatever the case might be. And then also prioritizing the human touch when it's needed. Right. And, and it's once again, it sounds simple. It's okay. You know, there's no CEO who's going to look at that list and go, no, I don't agree with that. Right. They're all going to go. Yeah. Sounds great. I, you know, we're, we're trying that ourselves, you know, but at the right. same time, being simple seems to also be really hard to do because, you know, we've got these top 10 brands that do it well. Um, but then I can think of a hundred other brands that really need to, re you know, look and take another look at this list because it seems that also being simple is hard. Now you mentioned that there's cost cuts, there's all sorts of market pressures, there's differentiation, you know, there's all sorts of things that is, it, it stands in the way of being simple. You know, why do you think that is? Do you, is it is it about legacy <clears throat> management styles? Like, what's at the core here? Well, I think if you are a CEO, you're going to say certain things um, which sound great. And of course, you know, what CEO is going <laughs> to, in an interview, answer a question by saying, no, Alex, actually, yes, we have sort of a mild focus on the customer, but actually, you know, what I'm trying to do is make sure that I have a job for the next three years. So I need to keep the shareholders happy. And in order to do that, I'm going to make sure that for the next, you know, couple of quarters, yep. I slash costs to the point where our profit margins look respectable. No CEO is going to say that. Um, but uh, that's exactly what they're doing. So there's a fair amount of, you know, is it fair to call it cognitive dissonance? Is, you know, do they say one thing and honestly believe that that's what they're doing? And in actual fact, they do the opposite. I don't know because I'm not in their brains, but it, it appears to be the case. Um, it it just it feels like the market forces are far more powerful than than anything else. And when you're weighing up the the difference between sort of long term opportunity by being customer centric or short term pressures of satisfying a shareholder, I think usually the short term sort of issues uh, win. And unfortunately, what happens is that if that happens too often, it becomes a self perpetuating cycle, and you can't ever get out of it uh, because then you're completely on the back foot. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of feel that that's, that's what, what the issue is. And, and I suppose it comes back once again to strategy. It comes back to what is your long-term plan to differentiate your business, which is really going to put a moat around your brand, put a moat around your business so that in 10 years time, you can be hugely competitive. Mm. Um, and just talking about banks, I, I think of one of the, the banks that we have here and it's a bank which is quite niche and they've said we only want to deal with a certain kind of customer with a certain net worth uh and rather than us using ai or sort of outsourcing our call centers to another cheaper country you actually have a personal banker and if anything goes wrong you have the cell phone number of your personal banker who will personally sort out the issue for you so that's going the other extreme. So if you are serious about this and you bring humans into it, um, this is one of the ironies is that I see so many companies that are like, oh, we're testing AI. <laughs> Let's see if we can use chat GPT to speed up stuff. I'm not seeing too many companies that are saying, actually, we're going to start bringing in people. We're going to start developing deeper relationships, stronger bonds with our mm. customers. We're going to bring in someone who is an account manager, like an expert worker of accounts, a magic maker, stuff to make our customers' lives so much easier. Wouldn't that be refreshing? But no, we're all on about chat GPT. Everyone's on about chat GPT. Chat GPT is a commodity. Who yeah. cares? It's, you know. It's, anyway. it's, it, it, you, you framed it so well, and it's worth just restating because in the hype and in the hoopla that we've all been, you know, caught up in over the last year or so about AI and all the consumer application we've seen with ChatGPT in particular, it's all been about how can we do more of that? 
Whereas the real trick, it seems, is to, if you are going to be looking at something like ChatGPT or, or, or AI, um, you know, automating the mundane, but then right. really allowing the exceptional part of the service to, <clears throat> to, to not only be bad, mined by humans, but how can we, how can we allow our use of AI to sort of almost double our investment in the human side to make that more of a differentiator, to make that a better experience? Because AI yeah. is never going to re replicate the human experience. It's going to replicate the human work <clears throat> part, but the experience part, like, yeah, when that personal banker comes online, I can feel completely trusted that if I've got something going or if there's funds missing or I need to ask a question, he's going to be hearing me in the best possible way, right? Right. And actually, if you want to have a little banter and talk about sort of the football over the weekend, yeah. hey, you could probably do that too. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm seeing so many companies, you know, we're I suppose we're all doing it, but so many companies are saying, well, actually, I need to produce content. I wonder if that content can be created by ChatGPT. Obviously, it can. But mm. I can tell you now, content that's created by ChatGPT is crap. Uh, and if you're honestly believing that you can outsource your business voice, like your thought leadership, something which is meant to be crafted by someone who is an expert, someone with thoughts and original ideas and stuff which is going to stand out in the marketplace. If you think you can outsource that to some dumb, large language model, then you're not taking it seriously <laughs> enough. Then just shut it down. Don't do it. You know, it's, yeah. it's hard work. You got to be like Alex and be playing around with the tech stack and making it integrate in real time. That you know, that's that's what you got to do. It's um, and people can pick it up. So yeah, they can. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think we're almost being lured by this stuff, uh, and I don't think people are necessarily thinking deeply about whether that's a good idea or not. Uh, you know, I'm well, not it's shiny, saying... right? It's the shiny object, yeah. and at the moment we're like, woo, you know. But I we're yeah we haven't found a proper use for it yet, or we're still in that period of. Right. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what I'm always amazed by is whenever I ask chat GPT for some help, uh, it always gives me long lists. It's like, how many points are you running now? It's always like 20 points. It's, wow. Okay. Well, you lost me at number seven. It's, it's just too much. Uh, and I suppose that to comes, simplify. well, that comes back to this whole simplified brands, you know, to simplify something is really a human skill. Mm. Um, it's as the Japanese say, if you spend your entire life trying to perfect a, a bonsai tree and you almost get there in the end, that's a life well lived. And, and I think that's simplification of brands. If, if you just keep on looking at your business, looking at the brand, looking at all of the communication mm. that you put out, and you try and get it to the point where it is super understandable and you can connect to the heart of an audience, then you've succeeded. Um, mm. And more and more, because people aren't doing that, I think it's really is something that helps you stand out. So, so yeah, I think it's worthwhile, something worthwhile to explore further. It's, it's absolutely. And a good segue to the, the, the second story, because, you know, from kind of commodifying the experience, but also at the same time, still keeping it simple and keeping it completely innovative is what you've noticed coffee shops are doing and how they've, uh, you know, taken the, the standard formula, but seem to be doubling down on their brand <clears throat> and their, and their content and being able to not only provide, you know, hopefully their shop goers with good coffee and, um, you know, decent hot drinks, but also this, this brand, you know, this brand that seems to stand out and to reinvent it and to remix it into mm. something that's more than coffee. What, what, what caught your attention on, on this topic? Well, as you're scrolling through there, that first image that you had of the, the coffee pouring onto the takeaway cup, I mean, that's something that cannot be created by mid-journey. So somebody has thought clearly, you know, about how they can create, uh, you know, how can you create some interest in something which is pretty mundane? And if you look at Instagram feeds of coffee shops, I mean, it's the same old pictures of flat whites and all that kind of stuff. What I like about the, this top 10 list is that if you go into the Instagram feeds of some of these uh, coffee shops, which understandably are all in the UK and they all are coffee shops which are you know they focus on craft more than anything else yes. they're not chain they're not chain stores uh but what i love about just the collection that uh, they put together 
is the fact that there's so much creativity in the communication. Yeah. So here's an example. Awesome. This is a coffee shop called Fika. Uh, and every single one of their posts, they have a little action figure, which is kind of demonstrating the product. But it's just engaging. It's interesting. Yeah. It's something new. And I absolutely follow that account just to see what they do next, um, which, again, is a great example of how do you build a brand around a commodity? You know, you can buy coffee pretty much anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so you've really got to think creatively about different combinations of coffee. Can you innovate the coffee itself? And there's so many areas that you can innovate that that drink. Um, but I think this collection, yeah, it's it's just a it's a great snapshot of where the industry is in the UK. Um, some of them focus obviously on on really good design uh, stuff that yes. looks very premium. Uh, some are like quite quirky and then others are very much product focused. So how can they innovate the roasting process? How can they talk differently about like what they do and what they're trying to achieve with, with coffee? Um, and it's, yeah, it, it seems to be one of those industries that people become loyal to quite easily. Mm -hmm. So once you've found your preferred coffee shop, you go back there and you get to know the people, you know, the barista's name, you Yes, yes, yeah. experience. You have your special yeah. table. So it yeah. is one of those businesses which is very human. You you spend a lot of time in a coffee shop and uh yeah, people people get to know you. It's it's quite a it's almost like going to church. It's like a new kind of right. religion in in many ways. Uh yeah, so an interesting list to to go and have It a also look it also seems like it's a it's a great way to explore innovation. You know, innovation is one of those big words that everyone wants to have but often you know can't define for themselves properly and right. it seems to me it's like okay well you work in the coffee industry it's not possible to innovate that much more coffee right it comes from the bean people want it a certain way you get it you know whether it's a frappe latte or an iced tea or iced coffee or a cappuccino or American, you know you're going to get your different variants and of course you can you can be fancy and and uh, and kind of you know really try and come up with different styles or forms of the product but then it's like okay well if we can't really push it too much more there then let's innovate somewhere else where it still adds value where it still mm. creates a different experience and that's what we've got here where they're doubling down on the creative aspect which is nothing to do with the product technically right it still tastes the same the styrofoam is still the same but now you've got this kind of almost consumer identity piece built into it as well where right. I go there, not not, and, and I'm happy to pay another, you know, half a pound or another, you know, pound more. But it's because I get this, and this says mm. something about me. Ah, that's exactly it. So I, yeah. you know, I, I've I've worked with a couple of um, alcohol companies, and uh, actually, a, a coffee brand is one of my clients at the moment. Um, but I often say to, to CMOs, I say, just never forget that when it comes to these kind of products, you are what you drink. So when you're walking around London with that coffee cup with, you know, that uh, beautiful piece of art on, on your cup, it says something about you. So now you have to attach meaning to that image. You have to have attach meaning to the brand label or, or whatever it might be. But that's really the job of marketers, that you've got to build meaning around a, a, a commodity, which coffee is. Um, and I think these, these shops have done very well to build that story out. They, they've built that meaning out to, to really carve out a financial margin for that business, which mm. ultimately good branding, that's that's what your aim is. Uh, you, you don't want to have a standard margin. You want people to demand your thing and limit the supply, and then you can charge uh, nice hefty profits on that. Um, so yeah, I think it's just a great example of, of where this specific industry is. And I suppose when I look at some of these posts, I just think, wow, such simple things actually make such a huge difference. That's it. Um, and there are a number of these companies that if you look at their Instagram feed and you scroll through it quickly, you can see that they color block the back of their images per season. So summer 2020 would all have been sort of color blocked orange. Uh, and then as they moved into autumn, it went red. And as they went into winter, it went blue. And, you know, it's something simple like that, which I suppose sort of a brand geek like me gets a bit of a thrill out because I know that someone was intentional about how they did that. Mm. Um, but I think that's the audience that you're speaking to. You're yeah. speaking to. Who would appreciate that. 
Yeah. Yeah. You're speaking to to younger people, I would assume, people who are, you know, pretty educated uh, and they're part of a community and they'll get a kick out of that sort of very subtle cue of the, someone is carefully curating this stuff. Absolutely. It's not just and, posting and, pictures. You know? And the curation part is so, is, is really the word there because, you know, the, 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 the kind of the time and effort to to put into a, an image like this, which is just such a beautiful photograph, firstly, but, you know, it, it just shows off the product so well as well, you know, it, it, from just transforming something that if I got at Starbucks, you know, we'd be lost to a styrofoam cup and kind of, you know, shipped off right. the line like it normally is. But here, it looks like the clouds of Jupiter and I'm, you know, I'm kind of mesmerized by this piece of art. Oh my God, I want one, you know, and I want one because that's what I would drink, you know? And so there's this, you know, crazy mm. powerful kind of insistence on that brand identity, which becomes the consumer identity as well. It's just, yeah. I know I'm going on about this, but it, it's, it's so interesting <clears throat> how that works. And it's so interesting when you unpack it, how, when it's done right, uh, it's not exploitative or it's not kind of psychological tricks or anything like that, but it's just something that we know that if we produce something like this, the audience and, and the people who, will resonate with it will resonate with it and they will and mm. they will come to it and they will build their own if you like digital identity based on this based on the drinks they choose to consume so it's right. it's such a simple once again it's <clears throat> like look at this you know it's so cool and so different mm. and adds no value to the beverage at all but right. it adds value to my experience of drinking it and enjoying it you know and so it's yeah mind blowing well as someone who's worked in the industry on that previous uh, image You'll also know that when that photograph was taken, this was probably one of about 10, because yeah. I can tell you now they would have mixed that drink a few times and they would have taken a shot. And now that it's done, it's done. You've got to get a new one. Yeah. So, you know, again, there's effort involved. It's someone actually Completely. had to sweat. They had to think very carefully about the lighting of the shot. Uh, and it's human crafting uh, we appreciate the work done by other human beings mm. and i think if a business or a brand puts in the effort uh and the audience or the customer can see the effort well then why wouldn't you want to go back to see what else they can do um that's really you know that's that's really the essence of what brand building is it's it's a story that unfolds and yeah you want to go see what else is going to happen next and what's cool as well is is once again the word craft that you use because coffee is obviously a craft itself and and you go back to a craft because it's done in a certain way it's good you know you can appreciate the root ingredients and you keep it that way you preserve the recipe you you know you maintain the craft but at the same time there's a way to kind of showcase the craft in a different way here in these gorgeous photos and these gorgeous kind of concept art maybe it also is a, is a sign for other companies or other brands or businesses who maybe wouldn't think of themselves as crafters in some way but there's a way to showcase that in the brand you know the brand is always there and it's always going to be as good a vehicle as you invest in it and if you're able to kind of excite yourself with content or or, or images or podcast material videos where there's something different here and I'm investing in, in seeing what is the craft of my service and wanting to tell that story. I would put money on, you know, that channel growing and that growing its own audience. Right. Um, exactly. And I think that's really the challenge for, for marketers is that that's where it's going. Mm -hmm. Um, the science is there, the tools are there. Everyone's got that. That's, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But what's really going to stand out is the craft. It's the flair. It's the artistry. It's mm -hmm. how do I now interpret this, you know, this brand for an audience and entertain them. And I didn't put on them on the list this week, but Apple released a four minute long video called fuzzy feelings. I think it is. Uh, it's their Christmas campaign. Now, Apple, as you know, one of the biggest brands in the world. Uh, but go and have a look at their Fuzzy Feelings Christmas ad. It is an absolute masterpiece in storytelling and filmmaking, uh, which lightly touches on the benefits of um, shooting animation on an iPhone 15 Pro. <laughs> right. Uh, so they've got the product there, but oh, the product is kind of in the background. What they're really sort of selling you is, 
is what the product can do and the actual interactions and feelings Experience. Uh, and relationships that the product can create magically. So they're selling the magic. Uh, you know, that that in itself is magic if you can get that right. Mm. That's mm. that's a professional at work. <laughs> you know, that that's what marketing needs. It really needs like strong professionals. And they're few and far between, unfortunately. Um because I think people haven't necessarily defined marketing in that space, but that's where I think great brands are moving towards. I suppose also just picking up on the Apple example <clears throat> is that the the additional step here where you where you're also referencing is that not only is 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 the storytelling and the experience part of the product, but it also seems that the making of that experience is part of the narrative you tell as well. Right in the in the in the in the fact that it, it draws attention to itself, you know, uh, where you can sit back and you can look at this as a as a cinematic masterpiece. Oh shit, it's an ad for Apple. But at the same time, <laughs> I can appreciate the the amount of work and you know all the storyboarding that went into it and all of that, and that's part of my experience of it as well, which right. makes me appreciate it as well. So that also seems to be the the production of it is part Very of the experience much so. too. Yeah. And, and that's the opportunity that I think, ironically, ChatGPT gives us. Because now we know that just creating an article is super easy. You know, a machine can do it for nothing. But if you really want to impress people, then make something by hand. And, you know, dedicate 5,000 hours to the stop motion photography of this thing. And as you say, the behind the scenes making of, uh, that's what gives yeah. the thing value. Because yeah. someone sweated. Um you know, I'm always amazed by old school rock stars like Foo Fighters when they go up on stage and they freaking for two and a half hours grind out tunes yeah. on a on a Gibson and they come off their fingers are bleeding like their voice is hoarse. Like I'll pay Dave Grohl, whatever, just sing, like <laughs> sing like that. But then, you know, you look at videos of Tomorrowland and there's some DJ putting on a cd and flicking a switch and like yay mm. look how cool i am mm. ah, come now so i think that's the thing it's you know that that old school craft the yeah. the making of like There's real like a performative ads. aspect to it it's got to kind of sing together it's got to hang together and not anyone Absolutely. can just throw that together right yeah somebody actually cares mm. and in in so many ways it comes back to our customer service example if someone actually cares enough to pick up the phone and say what's wrong your internet is down let me make it my daily mission today to fix it for you mm. like i'll be a customer for with that brand forever yeah. uh is it how scalable? refreshing yeah no yeah. is it valuable yes so you know that that's the conundrum how do you fix that mm. um hire people, uh, get, get brand ambassadors, get people to work on the brand. Um, that's, that's what I think really stands out. Mm. John, always great to spend time with you <laughs> and to, <clears throat> and to look at these things, enjoy our weekly convos and, um, and yeah, look at all these things with the future in mind. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Always great. Thank you. Until next time. Next week. Same time. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. And, and.